everyone. My name is Meg French, and I am the Executive Director of the Stephen Lewis Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us here today. I want to thank you for joining us for a conversation on Blackness, queerness, and stigma. As an organization based in Canada, the Stephen Lewis Foundation acknowledges that our presence here is a direct outcome of the settler colonial state whose policies of expulsion from the land and cultural genocide continue to impact Indigenous communities today. And we here at the foundation acknowledge that oppressive and inequitable socioeconomic and political systems in Canada continue to perpetuate this legacy of racism, intergenerational trauma, and structural inequality, and that this legacy is directly linked to the disproportionate impact of HIV on Indigenous communities within Canada. As a Canadian organization, we recognize that we have a role to play in the process of truth and reconciliation. And so we are undertaking a journey of ongoing learning and reflection, relationship building and solidarity in indig with Indigenous communities in Canada. So thank you again for joining us today to commemorate World AIDS Day. The HIV pandemic is still with us. In the year since last December 1st, so since last World AIDS Day, about 1.5 million people have been newly infected with HIV and 650,000 people have died of AIDS related causes. Around the world, inequities, stigma and discrimination and rights violations are driving the pandemic. In Sub-Saharan Africa, adolescent girls and women are three times more likely to acquire, to acquire HIV than boys and young men. And in Canada, indigenous populations represent 10% of all people living with HIV, despite making up only 5% of the population. And as we'll hear from our guests today, Two as LGBTIQ folks and racialized communities face daily challenges to their health and rights, limiting their access to prevention, testing and treatment measures. But at the same time, these communities are powerfully working to claim their rights, to support one another, to bring about change and to cut the HIV pandemic off at its roots. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation and I wanna thank our guests from Toronto Kiki Ballroom Alliance, from Icebreakers Uganda, and from Hoinas, Health Options for Young Men on HIV, AIDS, and STIs for joining us. And I'm really looking forward to, to your conversation. So thank you, thank you for being here. Um, to kick things off, I'm really pleased to introduce our moderator for today, Muhari. Muhari is a researcher, counselor, trainer, community mobilizer, and field representative with Stephen Lewis Foundation. Muhari has worked for two decades on health and human rights for people living with HIV. And as a leader at Black Cap here in Toronto, Muhari supports Black communities who are disproportionately affected by HIV and AIDS. So thank you, Muhari, and I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Meg. Um, I would like to introduce uh, the panelists today, and I'll start with King Louboutin who's a member of the Toronto King uh, Kiki Ballroom Alliance's Boutique House of Louboutin and TOMQ, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal and Quebec, uh, male sex worker programs. Uh, King is a coordinator at uh, ACT, formerly the AIDS Committee of Toronto. He's an educator whose work uh, focuses on destigmatization and community care for sex workers who identify as gay, bisexual, queer, trans male, and gender nonconforming. Welcome, King. Next, I'd like to introduce Keisha Miller, who is a member of Toronto's ballroom, ballroom community and coordinator of the trans and non binary uh, youth service plan at Black Cup. Um, Keisha is a humanitarian and a feminist dedicated to empowering black and trans communities and hopes one day to live in a world of equality. Welcome, Keisha. Next, I'd like to introduce Luswata Brandt, who is a human rights advocate, a peer health educator and executive director of Icebreakers Uganda. IBU operates a health clinic for LBTIQ community members, the first of its kind in Uganda. As a member of PEPFAR's key correspondent team, he, he reported on health issues affecting LGBTIQ communities in Uganda and serves on the um, Ediaka Diabantu Steering Committee, which monitors the quality of HIV services for key populations. Welcome, Brent. 
and my good friend, John Mavenge, who is a sex worker as health and legal rights activist and founder and director of health options for young men on HIV and AIDS and um, STIs, uh, otherwise known as HOIMAs in Kenya. He is also on the, on the steering committee for the Red Umbrella Fund, African Sex Workers Alliance, ASWA, an advisor for migrant sex workers, that's IOM, and a contributor to Identity Magazine Kenya. Welcome, uh, John. So um, I'll start with uh, questions and I'll start with you, John. Uh, could you give us an overview of the work that you, at, you do at Hoimas fighting HIV in Kenya? Please unmute, John. Thank you. Yes. Um, first, I want to take this opportunity to say thanks, especially to celebrate the World AIDS Day in, uh, in Canada, Toronto. As a gay man living the HIV for 21 years, it hasn't been easy. And, um, and the stigma is very high, especially, you know, like in Africa, where we come from, uh, coming out as gay is harder, is harder. But coming out as a gay man with HIV is, is more harder. So we really try to make sure that everything is okay. Um, try to bring people together and also acceptance, like people need to accept themselves. Because how we started, like how we started Hoimas, we started as a support group of seven people who went for a training and actually out of seven, uh, five, were HIV positive. And we started, we didn't have a place to go. We started meeting in a, in a small trees along the parks and still doing sex work. Then uh, that's how we started as an organization. That was back in 2006. And uh, we really did whatever we could, uh, selling, uh, selling sex on the street, doing everything. And we made sure that we registered Hoimas. Hoimas was not registered with money from the donor. Hoimas was registered by the community for the community and by the community. And for five years, we funded Hoimas and we made sure that we got a place, we got a lounge where people can sleep, we get all those kind of things. And today I'm very proud to say that leashing over 6,000 people in Nairobi is not easy. Also going back to Nyeri, because now we have a new branch in Nyeri, which had 3,000 people. Also going back to Kajiado, where now we have um, intersectionality, PWID, sex workers, uh, gay men and trans communities in Kajiado, where now we have reached 8,000 people. I think it is, takes courage, it, it takes time, it takes passion, it's not even about money. It is about you saving someone's life. And that's what I'm so passionate about. Like I need to see, I need to make a change. I will make a change and also doing a lot of advocacy to the government to make sure that we have all those kind of things. And you look back, Muhadi, in like a few years back, we didn't have everything. We didn't have anything. But today we are very proud to say that now we can access ARVs. We have clinics, which are now actually registered by the government. Just, just the end of this month, we were in level two. Now we have a level three clinics. So it goes, you know, you are great because of the service that you do. And also being very close, we know it's, it's very bad, you know, like we, can, we as a country can only go through health perspective to make sure that people listen to you better. I, yes, also like being also a petition of the repeal section 162, it has not also been easy because on the other side, I'm supporting the government, on the other side, I'm not supporting the government, but I have to separate two. Like I have the other side of me, like I'm so passionate about health and that's what we agreed with the government. The other side is me, where I need decriminalization. And that case is going to come up maybe in May or June. So it's not easy, but we try. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for sharing. And uh, on to you, Keisha. As someone who works with uh, the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention here in Toronto, could you also comment on the work you're involved in? Um, so, <coughs> sorry. Um, working for Black Hat, um, there are different sectors that, you know, we try to 
you know, fulfill in those different missions that we fulfill it within the company. Although overall we are an AIDS prevention association, we, you know, we have different things that we do. Like there's harm reduction, there's, um, there's things like mental health services, um, different different services. But what I particularly do is I work in um, ACB trans and non-binary youth employment. So my mission is to make the field, you know, for working for trans and non-binary youth who are Black a lot easier. Um, me particularly, I know that like when I was maybe a little younger, I used to have issues. Like when I first started transitioning, when it came to the work field, you know, it's harder to get jobs, um, especially when your IDs don't match um, how you present. So my goal is to distinguish any biases that employers may have on trans and non-binary youth and just make the, the field a lot easier to work in and more accepting. But on the side I do, I like that Black Hat gives me the opportunity to work with my colleagues on multiple things and multiple projects. Um, I sometimes support my harm reduction co-workers and colleagues will go on different excursions and do harm reduction work. So basically it's it's anywhere you could support in Black Hat. If you're able to support it, go ahead. So I like having that luxury. Thank you so much for sharing, Keisha. And uh, Brand, could you could you add some insight here, perhaps with your work at Icebreakers Uganda? What types of barriers does the LGBTIQ community in Uganda face when it comes to accessing healthcare resources? Thank you so much. Mohari and happy World Day's Day to everyone. Uh, it's the first time I'm having it in Toronto, not back home. I'm happy. Um, I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. I'm Swata Brandt. I work with uh, Icebreakers Uganda. The first organization that operates the first ever LGBT clinic in Uganda. And I'm happy that actually it is now registered and recognized by Minister of Health of Uganda to give out actually services to LGBT persons. A few years back, we didn't have anywhere to go. We were supposed actually were entitled to go to the mainstream health facilities. And actually we saw that we had a lot of challenges. For example, we had stigma and discrimination. We had um, people being actually um, uh, chased away from uh, the gate, the gate of the facilities, yeah, and then actually uh, people were becoming uh, becoming a torture section, for example, our, our transgender persons, and then we sat as IBU and we started an initiative of having a clinic. Of course, it was, it was a struggle because actually happening up a clinic in, a, uh, in Uganda is a challenge and more so for LGBT persons. And the reason that's why we opened up this clinic because of the barriers LGBT persons were facing while acquiring services and none of them were policies. You know very that back home in, in Uganda, we have actually discriminatory policies. We have policies that actually criminalize same-sex relationship. And actually people were like, okay, what if I go to this hospital and then I'm, I'm, being, I'm being arrested and detained? So how do I go about it? So uh, the policies also actually was a very bad barrier and still a, a, a very huge barrier when it comes to LGBT persons actually accessing services. Remember in 2014, uh, we had the uh, Anti-Homosexuality Act in Uganda that was passed. But good enough, we went to court and I was notified. But that doesn't mean actually it is done. We have the, we have the actually the Penal Code Act, Section 145, that still criminalizes actually same-sex relations. So that uh, policies and barriers as one of the biggest barriers on accessing actually healthcare services back home. Then we have um, religious and cultural norms, whereby you know in Uganda you have to marry a woman and a man and in church. So there is no way we should say that a man is marrying a man. So a man is marrying a fellow man. And also we grew up actually in that, um, those uh, cultural norms whereby, okay, my father, my father believes in actually, uh, let's say as homosexuality as a taboo. 
And then actually I grew up in a Christian family. So whatever you see it on a TV and actually something comes about homosexuality, you see how the family can even actually don't even want to talk about it. So religious and cultural norms are also a big challenge in Uganda while accessing something. As you know, actually, uh, you know, a Catholic church back home, you cannot even uh, talk about using condoms in church. And you know, people are getting HIV every day. And actually, a religious leader, I'm a Catholic, actually, by Christianity, standing up and saying, you know what, we cannot, be, we don't believe in condom use. We saw that actually people were um, even actually uh, chasing away projects that were, were, were targeting LGBT persons because they are, you know, for us, we are religious, we, are our, we don't believe in condoms. No, even if the, our, um, the Pope said, you know, people should start using condom, but you know how actually, how progressive we can be as African countries. The other is actually the same myth and misconception of uh, LGBT persons. If you talk about LGBT persons, people sexualize LGBT persons. They always actually think about sex in the anus. And actually, you know, not knowing that actually you can even have a, be in a relationship without even having penetrative sex. But they, they went ahead to say, to have those misconceptions, actually LGBT persons wearing pampers, LGBT persons, you know, the, a lot of actually misconception that has also actually shunned away the people or our, our service users to go and access our, our services. We have uh, ignorance from health, first, uh, health, uh, health uh, practitioners, for example, onwards. People are ignorant. I remember I have uh, working on a case whereby someone has operated. So I mean, how do you operate onwards? Yeah, so there's ignorance in, in terms of information, knowledge, and handling actually LGBT persons. There was one thing of actually that accepting to, to, uh, to handle LGBT persons, but do you know how to handle the complications and the health uh, complication of LGBT persons? So that actually also remains a, a question. For community, that was for external, but for community, we have self stigma. You know, we have that self stigma of, you know, as uh, John said, you know, you're LGBT persons, you're living with HIV, and then actually you, you, you always ask yourself, to, what if I go to that uh, facility and this happens? What if, how can I go there and actually talk about myself? How can I open, talk about uh, me open, uh, uh, open being gay? So there's a lot of actually self stigma when it comes to people accessing services. And also deliberate intentions of being outed you know, you're going for a, uh, to a facility, you don't know whom you're going to find, yeah? For example, if I find, if I walk into a facility and actually I, 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 uh, they, they, give me a, they give me a counselor and that counselor knows my family. Or if I, yeah, or if um, my aunt is an in, is a, 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 in, a, an in charge of a medical facility, you know, that will be automatically deliberate what? Open, and then we have a, 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 an HIV act back home which says if I, if I test positive, the counselor or the medical practitioner has the, has the mandate to tell my partner. Yeah, you know, sometimes you wake up, you're like, okay, what if the counselor tells my partner? You know, back home, all of us, are, some of us are, um, are, um, are operate on sex work. Yeah, so what if my partner is paying for my rent, education, and then I test positive and then as a, a medical uh, practitioner, you know? You know how we can, how can, how can, how I can actually fall into mental health uh, challenges and all that. So we have poverty. Poverty is a very big, actually, a challenge back home because many people are not working. You saw when the pandemic came to play, some people even don't have transportation to go to the facilities to get actually treatment. So that also shuns, uh, shuns them away from getting uh, the resources. And then we have actually funding that actually decreasing because actually we have clinics. You've heard the homeless about talking about that amazing work they do to the community. I speak as we have a clinic, but then the clinic is not a one-stop shop. At a certain point, we have to refer someone to get a different service. Yeah, unless uh, 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 then we would actually it would have, it would have been better to uh, someone to walk into a transgender person's walk into icebreakers Uganda and you get whatever you want. But then the funding is really low. But uh, and then actually, as I conclude, we have transfers of actually transfers of health uh, service providers. You know, we've oriented um, this, uh, these healthcare providers. He knows, uh, he knows how to handle LGBT persons. And then uh, because of the structure of the government, he or she has to be transferred to another 
and facilities. Leaving these facilities with no knowledge or little knowledge about how to handle LGBT persons. Also, and that has also contributed to our community members not accessing services. We have RS sanitation without your medication. For example, RS actually are on a rampart back home in Uganda. You might find in a week they arrest more than five or six people. But these people, some of them, they, uh, they live with HIV. You arrest them. We don't know where the, where the detention center is. And then actually they, are, they, are, they don't have their medication. So how, do, how will they actually adhere to their treatment? And sometimes it's actually a shanzai from a, um, um, getting a service. And then tools, the government tools to capture data. In a, a back home, we have the, the capture only two genders. That is female and male. What of the, uh, what of the transgender persons? What of the non-binary persons, yeah? And actually, you're like, it's really strange. So you either actually, you, 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 either, you ask yourself, as a transgender person, am I going to be counted as a, as a man or a woman? Yeah, so we need also, we will try it as much as possible to advocate the, for example, this IHMIS tool in government to capture that, but it's still a, 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 a journey. So we hopefully that pray that actually by the next time I'm presenting on the World Days Day, I'll giving positive feedback. And also I cannot, um, I cannot actually conclude without actually talking about stigma and discrimination. Actually surprising, this is the first time ever I'm putting, I'm putting, I'm wearing something rainbow on my watch, on my body. I'm wearing rainbow uh, socks, but back home you cannot even wear it because wherever they see rainbow, you either discriminated, you either you know, ask a lot of questions. So that's the reason. That's the way we uh, operate back home. But actually, I'm hopeful and actually uh, determined that things will change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brent. Uh, King, uh, having worked extensively with ACT. Do you see similarities in the barriers uh, facing the Black community in Toronto, or more widely, uh, the Canadian context? Yeah, for sure. Thank you again so much for having me here today. Um, a lot of my work at ACT, um, my program is called Tom Q. So it's Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Quebec. And we are a collective of uh, aid serving organizations um, that work together to destigmatize uh, sex work specifically for guys who do sex work because there's really not much information when you look uh, or data at all about guys and sex work. One of the only uh, reports that we could find were mostly from the states so a lot of our data and a lot of our collection was just coming from the state so with Tom Q we said well okay so let's get into community more see from community what is going on and Tom Q is by sex workers for sex workers so everyone who works on the Tom Q project is a sex worker or has previously been a sex worker and we heavily heavily rely on community support to tell us what you need um, and then we support it and provide it the only issues is that with funding. So we're having issues finding funding to run um, events, um, but thankfully we were able to receive funding through uh, the government to uh, sustain Tom Q. So we're working with uh, ACT, which operates out of Toronto, uh, MAX, which operates out of Ottawa, uh, MIELS and Rezo, which both operate out of Quebec and Montreal. Uh, so across Ontario, a lot of the barriers we're seeing is the stigmatization when um, service users go in to um, access care uh, across the board. So not only in the medical sense, but when accessing um, psychological care, when accessing um, massage therapy treatments, acupuncture treatments, um, just basic things. So folks who are living with HIV, especially when trying to access acupuncture, I'm seeing from community is there's stigma, folks don't wanna treat them mm -hmm. um, or folks are just giving them the runaround. So because in Canada, we can't really discriminate too much, but we'll quietly discriminate. So we'll give you the runaround. You'll see like five or six doctors, you won't get treatment. You won't get care. When you do go in to get care, you're sitting and waiting um, in the waiting room for what seems like forever, hours till you just aren't getting care. Um, I've had service users come back and tell me that they're 
being stopped from receiving treatment uh, or testing because they've been testing too frequently. And a lot of my service users are sex workers, so we know when we should be getting tested. Um, we're aware of testing windows and access to care. So having access to care in Canada is a little bit, I would say, easier but not necessarily because then you have the stigma of the doctors who are there who recognize you, see that you've been in here before and will stop you from getting treatment. Um, another thing that we see is just lack of knowledge from healthcare workers. Um, when it comes to treating black folks, like <laughs> we're just folks, <laughs> we're just people uh, first to so treat us like people first um, and then everything else after that. So maybe even having conversations uh, so a lot of my work deals with uh, bridging the gap between sex workers, um, ASOs, so aid serving organizations, uh, health workers, and trying to create programs and services that best serve community members. So I can echo a lot of what Bryant said um, with the barriers to healthcare. There's just isn't too much when it comes to legislative um, barriers because of the laws and the charter of rights and freedoms that we have in Canada. Um, but when it comes to stigmatization, it's still there. Um, folks are facing stigma when it comes to landlords uh, and just living situations. So if somebody is doing sex work and they don't have let's say a square job where they can put this on the rental application, how am I going to secure housing? So a lot of our work deals with, okay, so how do we get you housing? How do we get community support? And then a lot of the subsidized housing that we have in Ontario, the wait list for the housing is looking like seven to 10 years um, to get on a wait list to then secure some sort of subsidized housing um, that doesn't ask for a work rec recommendation or something of the sorts. Um, and then we're having community members who are being evicted from their homes because they're taking too many clients in their homes and their neighbors are complaining on them, saying that they're seeing too many people come frequently in and out of their space. Um, so with that, then now you're not getting as much work because now you you don't have anywhere to stay. So you don't have anywhere to take any of your clients and now you're on the street. So with access to care, it mostly deals with the stigma of it and then branches from stigma um, to maltreatment and mispractice um, in healthcare, but then across the board because community care doesn't only stem through healthcare, but through housing, through financial support, um, through psychological support. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and uh... I'll go back to John and Keisha and really, you know, thinking about these barriers, what are your thoughts around addressing some of these barriers? We can start with John and then Keisha. I think uh, uh, stigma and discrimination is a bad disease. It's a disease. To me, I take it as a disease because stigma starts with it also starts with ourselves, we as the community, because sometimes we we want to be treated by our own fellow communities and we want to have gay doctors, see what, all those kinds of things. So see, must start with that. So, and uh, how to address uh, uh, these barriers is also to engage other people, like engage um, those straight people or whoever you want to employ, as long as they are professionals. Let them know you because we want people to know us, but you also don't want people. We want to be known, but you don't want people to know us. So it's always good to treat other people. Like what I have done uh, to address the stigma within uh, Hoimas is like we did uh, a need assessment with the community in terms of hiring. I don't hire people. We advertise. People apply. And then we get the team from the peer educators, from the staff to, to interview. And uh, I'm surprised that we don't even have a, a man. Like we don't even have one. We all have ladies, like all of them are women. Like I didn't believe it because other gay facilities, they say, oh, we want black gay men, we want to do what? But surprisingly, because I don't even interfere. So I realized that this is a way of reducing stigma. And also, um, you, you know, you need to break the barriers. How do you break the barriers is to make sure 
like nobody should be outed in terms of their status because most of the time we as community when we get drunk and we have our own communities as doctors our counselors we start outing people in a bar yeah we start outing people in a bar so how do you do it let people get professionals it doesn't matter about your sexuality all what we need is someone who can handle the services and especially as Frank said like Anawat, like Anawat is a very serious thing, like in Kenya, where people don't even understand, but I realize, like, because that's something that we are doing for the whole country, we are treating, um, we are doing service, we are doing surgery for Anawat's management and HIV, HPV vaccine. So how do you, how do you talk to this to the government? Because how do you break these barriers? It's only have a sitting with the government. Sometimes the government is not good, sometimes it's very good. They listen. And if something new, they will listen. So sometimes you have to go when the government is very happy and abuse them politely. You know, you have to abuse the government politely. Don't just go and attack the government, abuse them politely. So you have to go in a very simple way and then you are abusing them and you are attacking them there. So we can only reduce these barriers if we, our community, accept our seal. I know it's very hard for people to come out uh, even to talk about their sexuality, but it's always also good for us to respect people. If we want to reduce the barriers, then we want to break the barriers, we need also to respect other people because if we don't respect people, the same people. And I was talking to some of my colleagues who are here, like, how do we go about all these barriers? But sometimes we don't have to go there as communities, as LGBT persons. We said, we, we said like the Minister of Health to talk on our behalf, because if you have a clinic, and it's recognized by the government, let the people in the government speak on your behalf. And that's the only way to, to reduce the stigma and also to break some of these barriers. Sometimes the government, you don't have to sleep with the government, but sometimes you have to sleep with the government for a better, for, you know, for, for the good of the community. So I think it's not easy, but um, we try, we try. Like, like in the world is today, most like today we, one of the things that I have realized and one of the policies that I have made at Hoimas for five years, like we will not do meetings in hotel. Like I will not do any meeting in a hotel. One of the things that we do as an organization is to make sure if you are doing, if you are doing a police sensation, let them come to your office. Let them see all those rainbow colors. Let's have lunch with you together. Let's share the same gay office. And then they see. And also to allow other people like where we are based we have mechanics down our office and uh, and the police station is ajax actually allowed us but most of the police now access services at hoimas most of this mechanic all of them actually access services at our place so you have also have to have a good neighboring and make sure that let the people know that you have a facility of which support people so that's another way of breaking the barriers also like a day like today where people go um, like when you are doing the, the, the GBV desk, you paint a very nice and put a sticker donated by Hoimas, you go to the police station and you clean the police station, you arrange them, you cook the, you, you cook to the prisoners, and then you donate that table, and also cleaning the government facilities. Let these people know who you are. Also using the, the case navigators. The case navigators are the people that we train, we place them in government facility. As Brand said, you can't have everything in your facility. Yeah, like a one-stop shop. Yes, we have all this, but we there are things like the mental health they have to refer. Like um, uh, we do TB, that's fine. But other other things that we can't like we uh, like we ca we can't do everything together. So that's how you have case navigators. The case navigators are trained. Where now you talk to the county, like for example, I live in Nairobi County. You have to talk to the governor. Then the governor, if there are five hospitals that stigmatize people you place one person there who is an LGBTI person. They'll be drinking, eating lunch, and closing together with an LGBTI person in an office. So they are there to let people who are LGBTI person to show them the lines, to show them everything. And that's another way of like breaking the barrier. Let those clinical officers, those clinical officers or the medics who are in those facilities knows, like this, these people who come from Hoimas, they are not bad people, they are good people. They come here, they clean for last facilities. They come here, they clean. They come here for Christmas to make our children happy. So that's also our duty as community, not just say the cream, the cream, the cream. It's not going to do something good to us. It's actually going to do harm. But whether it's good to have decriminalization, yes. 
But when it comes to the how to break barriers, we need to change the taxes on how we do work. You can't take criticals officer in a hotel for training. Bring them to you. Train them, eat with them, have lunch with them, let go them through that facility. Train police within your facility, let them see and go to the, like in Kenya, we have Nyamachoma, a place like we eat meat, roasted meat. So we go there as poli all of us, are, as, after the meeting with the police, we eat Nyamachoma, we take like one beer, one beer, and then that's create a very good environment for, for us as a, as, a, uh, as a community. Thank you, John, for that insight. Uh, Kisha, your thoughts? Sorry, um, I just feel like personally, the way we can break a lot of stigmas in the mass society is being, you know, being able to be in certain spaces, even though you may feel uncomfortable, but representation is always key. You know, like being, being able to be in certain spaces where you feel like you aren't able to be in, and thriving in those spaces will allow people to understand that, you know, there's stigmas against individuals who are in the LGBT community or racialized. They, it could just be diminished because I feel like when people place you in a box and you stay within that box, you're gonna remain there. But when you go outside of the box, then they realize, oh, you know, Maybe this, these people can do this or that person could do this. And also I feel like a way to break barriers is to just educate yourself on, on community and educate others. Like personally, I feel like within the LGBT community, I feel like we stay within, we stay within our group Say, say somebody is a gay man. He doesn't want to learn anything about, a lot of the times they don't want to learn anything about transgender people or lesbian people. We are one community and we need to learn each other because if, if we are in a rough and we're, we're not united, we can't go out into the world screaming and preaching when we're divided ourselves. It starts at home, you know? And um, in terms of like healthcare services, I feel like we need to be able to share our resources with others. You know, like say say you're a transgender woman, and you know you got you went to this place for a certain procedure or to get hormones. Don't hold withhold that information from the rest of your community. Be like, oh, I went to this place and that place, and you know just helping your community where you see you need to help them that will distinguish any barriers we need to help each other and realize that once we help each other other people will help us and you know that's how i feel thank you keisha and i want to go back to brand and then to john um how has uh, slf helped overcome or lessen some of these barriers that you've spoken about today? Thank you so much, uh, Mohari. Uh, SLF has really done a lot of actually good work in terms of how these barriers are going to be or are, are trying to be broken. For example, I'll share the projects that are, that are tailored to the needs of LGBT community, specifically projects that are tailored to the needs of LGBT community. For example, when we look at ACTIF, ACTIF is addressing issues around mental health challenges of LGBT community. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, in this way, we have to, we, 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 we ensure that actually everyone knows about what's the meaning of mental health knows where to get actually um, knows where to get information or even services of mental health back home yes they talk about mental health but the implementation is not really effective but actually when it comes to active we live we we, we own the implementation we know the needs of our community we know where we can refer them to get services and actually we've also come up with the actually initiative that actually deals with mental health services for example uh, as um 
as, um, as, uh, as staff members and peer educators and all the uh, icebreakers in Uganda, we had no one that was, that was dealing with mental health challenges. But when ACTIVE came upon, we also take a pause and we go attend retreats to reflect, to energize, to also rethink again. Because back then, when you, when you look at our schedule, it's about work, 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 work. What, but who works on us as well? So that's actually projects also looks at actually uh, people like actually like um, um, John, who is on the front line when serving the community. We've come up with that. We've uh, launched uh, uh, mental health hubs whereby if you don't feel like sitting in your office, you can go to the uh, chilling zone, the mental health hub, lie down, work without actually stress. So really these projects that are really tailored to the needs of LGBT uh, persons that's really uh, broken actually barriers. Now people actually, even our government entities actually uh, are coming to visit Icebreakers Uganda to see how we, how we set up the mental health hub, to get information and how to deal with, you know, some different mental health. That shows that actually, you know, it is big, it starts with us and then actually they're also learning with us. You cannot fail to attend a meeting and people talk about the mental health services at IBU. I can be seated in a meeting without saying any, anything and then the uh, government official or something like, hey, but I think Icebreaker is doing something about mental health. So, you know, us actually, as Stephen Lewis is empowering our organizations to deal with actually our own issues, our, 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 as help us more to deal, uh, to break up uh, some of this barrier. And then, of course, um, uh, the collaboration, for example, we collaborate with our our, people, our, our, our brothers and sisters from uh, East Africa, whereby we always actually get what is working in Kenya. Yeah, oh, actually, uh, for now, actually, I'm getting ready to go and visit Hoimas because also Hoimas has a similar clinic. So I really want to know what good practices am I learning from uh, from Hoimas that I should take back home and then vis a vis. So these actually also cross learnings has actually enabled us to break these uh, these uh, barriers because I was sharing that all of these two weeks I've been sharing with my brother of Nairobi. Okay, we have a clinic. How do I do this? How do I break this? How do I break this? So that shows that actually the the, the the SLF uh, initiatives to bring us together has really helped us to uh, to 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 bury the, uh, uh, to uh, to um, get out with this uh, stigma. For example, I would say uh, there's an activity we did uh, mapping out mental health centers, both LGBT and mainstream in Uganda. It turned that it was a an, um, it was a step. Or, or it was a step to open us actually a door because actually John said you cannot work alone. Yes. So we went actually mapped out these centers and then said, okay, you work with LGBT persons. How do you want us to help you? You know, that shows that there's a window of collaborations. Uh, how and why? Because of the initiative of the uh, uh, Stephen Wiss Foundation. I would say also e-learning, and I'm here in, uh, also learning, uh, learning other learning cycle We're here in Canada to learn. We've been here in two weeks to learn on how to, to work together, to learn on how to, if, you, if you're setting up a project back home, how do you, how do you set it up? We, 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 we've met with uh, uh, several different government officials, Canadian government officials that actually uh, try to share how the, the, the local initiative they have, but in countries that actually we can tap into so we can also um, that do with uh, this barrier. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John. Um, first, I want to personally, this is the first trip that I have stayed out of the office. Like uh, this is the first trip that I, I have never been to a trip for more than two or three days. So this is part of my mental well-being. I have never, I, I travel different countries, but I, I don't stay more than two days, even in my own country because I gave so much time to people, I forgot about myself. I forgot about like I have two adopted beautiful children. So I don't have time for my family. So through this, uh, through SLF uh, and through Active, I really have learned and through the need assessment. First, I thought about myself first, leave alone the rest, myself first, because it is me. So first I focus on myself before I even thought about other people. So, and that is the most important thing that I never thought for over um, 25 years of activism. I never thought about this. Uh, someone who will come from just from nowhere and tell you now this is what you can do. And through this, through uh, SLF that we have done a lot of advocacy for mental health and Kenya has just gotten one, um, a mental health curriculum, which uh, 
uh, Hoimas, Meigo, and other organizations for LGBTI persons are part of the order of that book, which is adopted by the government. So sometimes it's good because we, as members of SLF in Kenya, we have done a lot of inputs in the in the curriculum, and we are trying to do so so that at least it's better for each and everybody. Also, uh, one of the things that I realize that I never every time uh, I'm always on the computer and my phone. I never thought one day I will leave and say I'm going out for lunch. I never went for lunch. I never did anything. Like everybody was, I need to write a proposal. I need to do something. I need to report to a donor. I need to do all those kinds. Almost you go almost nuts because of thinking about donor. But one of the things that I have realized with my, my program person now, Jessica, that you don't have to, I mean, I keep on lighting to them and tell them, you know what? I am tired. You see your report on Monday. And that's good. It's a genuine partnership. It's not about between donor and uh, a partner. For us with the SLF, it's about genuine partnership. And this actually can be taken to other partners and donors. Like there are donors who cares about other people. There are donors who just want numbers and reports. And through SLF, I think it's not even about numbers. It is about self-care. Like the self, my self-care matters and also the staff of SLF uh, self-care matters. So we really need to make a lot of change. And for me, I have something to carry each and every day. Like I have been here. The best lesson I have learned, like I have been here. Muhali, we, we had a very good day with you. Like I realize it's all about, like even if something happened today, those people will always be your enemies. Like the people that we serve, they always treat you as nothing. So we don't, who cares about us? So sometimes we as leaders, we have to care. And that's something that I have learned even when I go back to Kenya. It's not about how much you give to the society. How much, how much do you give to yourself? Because community sometimes will not accept you. And I give something because I realize, Alan, when you are in, in Mombasa, something happened and everybody actually left you. Yeah, and you became the bad person and all those kind of things. So it doesn't, and you give so much to the community and people never recognize that. So something that I have learned and something that I've learned through SLF, first you, give, you have to give it to yourself. Leave alone with the people first, give it to yourself. And this is what I will be preaching every day. This is what I'll be doing every day. I will not go back to the office. Like I talk to Jessica, I talk to so many people and say, don't give it at work. Like I leave work nine o'clock at night. I arrive work at six o'clock. I have no time for my children, I have nothing. So for now, as an organization, like we have put time, like 12 o'clock on Friday, mental well-being for everybody close the office nine to five nine to four o'clock we open the clinic we open everything nine to five don't call me on sunday or saturday because we have someone who delivers trucks and arvs so we have a lot of arvs down at the and then we have a soldier down there in case someone want arvs and which one they want they pick from there but saturday and saturday is my day off and that's what i have really learned like I never had time for my children. And also my staff also kept on asking me, what can we do? We don't have time for, your, for ourselves. So through SLF, through staff retreat, where I, 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 we had to go for retreat and stay with the staffs and agree with the staffs. And the other thing is how do you, this is the only program that makes you learn how to be nice to your staff. This is the program that learn, that help us on terms of forgiveness because sometimes staff are so bitter with you and they don't want to tell you. So this is, this is a program that you can, and this is through the SLF, it's a program that you can actually talk to the program person and you can adjust some of the budgets, reallocate some of the budgets. It's not just about number. And the other most important thing is having 325 people on ART in the program is very, for me, having those support groups, like through SLF, having those support groups, because in those support groups, when you are talking to people in support groups, you have to tell them about their mental well-being and have really learned a lot, like we are doing stories. And one of the things that I'm doing the story is where people come, they, they are like a group of 2020, they are writing story, you don't have to put your name, you don't have to do anything, go in a different room and write a story. Bring all the, go and collect all the stories together, put them in a box and you pick anything and then read someone's story. And you realize a lot of people have the same thing. So that is another way of empowering community that it is not only me, 
It's, only, it's not only me, other people are going through that. And that's something that I will do this because I want to print that book in terms of documenting, like this is the stories of our life, what people go through. And I, I will encourage other people to make sure that they do those stories when they're doing support groups and don't put names. It really is help people to realize that I was kicked out of school, another person was kicked out of school, then people start sharing because you wouldn't know who, but some, someone within the community will understand, oh, I can also have, I have friends. So this has brought people together to make sure that we work as a team. And I will prefer this, like, this, this, should not, um, this should not be a program that should end. We really need to advocate for this program to go on each and every day and where we can also advocate to the government to allocate more budget on uh, mental well-being. Thank you so much, John. So we are pressed a little bit for time, but the conversations are amazing. So we'll try and hope we can still get a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, but I'd like to ask King, since you and Keisha are representatives of the Toronto Kiki Ballroomara Alliance, uh, I want to pivot the conversation towards the importance of art, dance, and expression. Uh, ballroom and drag have an important history within the Black and queer community as a form of celebration and also as a form of protest. Could you briefly speak to the importance of creating spaces for these types of art? Yeah, um, so very briefly, <laughs> it's very important uh, to create spaces for queer Black youth to develop, but not only to develop, but to feel celebrated and loved and accepted um, because it starts with accepting yourself as we spoke about in our conversation earlier and feeling acceptance from your community to then have the, um, I wanna say, what is it, the courage, <laughs> to then have that courage to then go out within your community and make change. Um, so, the important of expression as well is to be able to find what makes your heart set on fire because you can't pour from an empty cup as what John was saying earlier, you can't give if you don't have. So the importance of being within the arts, celebrating not only yourself, but celebrating your community and uplifting your community. Um, and historically, as we saw like drag, and being trans was extremely illegal. Um, and in some parts of the world, it still is extremely illegal. So ballroom stemmed out of the underground scene for the need um, for acceptance, for um, community, just being around black folks. Like I, the first time I even walked into a ball, I was like, wow, there, I've never seen so many black queer people in one place before. And it made me so happy. And I felt so whole and accepted. So creating these spaces really does um, positively change and impact our, the community, especially the community as a whole. Um, he, I don't know if you want to say anything about that as well. Keisha. Um, I definitely agree. Being in the Toronto Kiki Ballroom scene has propelled me to many heights. And, you know, because of building that confidence when you're in a space where you're accepted, celebrated, as King said, then you you see your own self value and you can take that out into the real world it's not only a, a self expression it's it's learning how to build that individualism that you can take out into the world and that confidence so that's how i feel it's very important to have that thank you so much and john and brand do you feel like there are ways that the community organizations you work for uh, can use art um, and expression in this way? Uh, yes, because I think now we're, uh, we're tired of actually the same usual uh, strategies while sending out messages. For example, we talk about HIV testing, go and test, go and test, go and know your HIV status, but can we do it in a unique way? For example, I'll give an example of uh, what they did this year. This year, we're not going to sit as a classroom city. What we did, we, we were bringing a band, yeah? 
people are going to be dancing, the band is, uh, is going to be passing on information on how to um, advocate for, uh, for, for, for uh, safe treatment, to, uh, for, treat, uh, for, test, uh, for te HIV testing and all that. Because actually we've thought, uh, we saw that actually if you uh, change, if you bring art into implementation, you get, you, that, that you, you get to reach very many people rather than actually using the same, same, same old strategies. So what we did with, well, we, we, we partnered with an, 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 a, male, uh, a male organization, sex work male organization, to also to see how we can uniquely bring together our people and get this information. And then we have organization like Faru that actually deals with art to send out messages. For example, art as a tool to send out um, messages, advocacy messages. We've seen them coming out with wellness journal of which are just the visual yeah you branch you need to take water to stay safe branch you need so that actually those things actually art helps actually uh brings more people to uptake services yeah for example actually <laughs> i'll share an experience whereby whenever i'm going to, to see a dentist a dentist is my worst doctor yeah but then if it was if there are a way of actually not actually don't bring in those uh, too many machines or say actually it's, uh, bring a, 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 a very strategic Think of how or in an art way on how to actually um, um, entice people to take up, take up that service. That will be okay. But wherever I, I go to a dentist, the first thing I get is actually uh, uh, depression because I'm seeing a lot of um, small, big, long metals that are going into my mouth. So really, we need also to create art. We've seen actually as uh, people coming up with um, documentaries. For example, if you enter our clinic, you will see a visual expression of actually how to enter offices, uh, how to, uh, how do you go to fast and all that. So that people, you know, some people, you know, don't know how to read. Yeah, how to read. But then if you see, if they get into those visual, visual, visual um, strategies, that really helps. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brent. Um, John, do you have any ideas? And we will yeah. As we continue con uh, this conversation, we will open it up for Q and A. So some questions might be coming in, but uh, John, what would be your response? I think it's not about testing because we did put HIV test as the key to LGBTI and so many people fear to come for testing. So one of the, something that we are doing in uh, Nairobi, especially for LGBTI person, it is, especially there is a lot of uh, H -A -H -A -H uh, hepatitis. And, and because we do the vaccine for free, a lot of people come for vaccination for hepatitis. So when they are doing vaccination, that's when you can also encourage people to go for HIV tests. Then we are also now encouraging people for HIV vaccine for women. So a lot of people come now to the facility, not because of HIV and also STIs. If we remove the word uh, HIV testing, now you also need to encourage people to come for STI testing because that's a common in our, in our community. So I think when we tell people about HIV testing, people actually try to say, oh, those people are just HIV testing and all those kind of things. So I think we really need to change on how we address our community. Like we have those events called uh, Let's Get Real Events where they are being uh, like creative spaces where people actually not in the office, where people go and meet somewhere, let's get lit. And nobody will understand why they have this feature of let's get lit because they have rainbow colors and you ask someone, what's let's get lit? Of course, I'm an LGBTI person. Don't you know they are there? Let's get lit. Like you need to do HIV is there, let's get lit. So me, I think those kind of taxes that we need to check that taste on how we approach our community, not just HIV. We must test people, yes, because it's part of our life. But at the same time, let's also change on how to have something like a goodie bag, where you put condoms, you put dental dams, like you give people like a, a packet, a chocolate, something where you deliver to people. At least people now will be very, yeah, will be willing to access services. Thank you. So we have questions coming in. Um, and I have one last question for everyone. I know, King, you had a question. Maybe when you're responding, you can also ask your question. And this is to all of us, to all the panelists. What are, what tangible things can allies of the Black queer community worldwide, what, what tangible things can they do to support your work? Uh, and this is for all, so anyone who's ready can, can respond. 
Yes. I'm going to ask or just add on to uh, previous conversation pieces. But yeah, for ballroom as well, we have um, balls were created as well as a place uh, for sexual health, mm -hmm. knowledge, and understanding. So when we do have a lot of our balls at the back, we do have um, sexual health booths um, with ASOs and different organizations where you can access services and care. Um, and then through ACT and Tom Q, we offer comfort packages for folks who do sex work and folks who are trans and folks who P and P. So in those comfort packages, there's soap bar, um, a grocery gift card. Um, uh, what else? We have coloring book and pencil crayons, and then you can access any harm reduction materials you wanted. So if you need condoms, lube, dental dams, any of those services, we just give them completely for free. And all you have to do is fill out a form um, on the website. So then through the TKBA as well, too, um, at our balls. So we have the World's AIDS Day Ball that's coming up this Saturday. So again, through knowledge and understanding. So we don't know if we don't talk about it. So starting the conversation um, by going to balls and holding these types of events, but then also giving back to the community in a meaningful way um, through comfort packages. Um, so I can echo what you said for sure, John. Um, and I think that allies giving back to the community, if you have funds, <laughs> you know where to place them, definitely support that way. Um, if you don't have funds and you can support within bringing something um, like as in supporting with your time supporting if you have if you have a profession you know how to make a website and there is an organization that needs a website make that website for them um, if you can drive and you have a car you have access take some folks to the clinic um, if you have cash that is just sitting on the side and you go to a ball and they say this the, the cash prize is zero and you have an extra $20 in your pocket, give that extra $20 because you know where it's gonna go within community. So just seeing where the needs in the gap, asking community, hey, if you have a couple of friends, hey, what do you need? Do you need your lights to stay on this month? I will give you money to pay your rent this month. I will give you money for groceries or maybe I will take you to the grocery store. So those are meaningful ways you can give back to your community. Maybe just ask your friends what they need and then support in that way. Thank you. Um, I was definitely also going to say a great way to support um, Black queer communities as an ally is definitely funds, like <laughs> definitely funds, sponsor. Um, I know certain organizations, they'll have the pride flag only up on like June. Please don't do that. Um, show your support yearly. Help in different ways you can, like you know, donating. It's donations are great. Not only money, clothes, food, different different way, different things like that can make a huge impact in the community. And um, also, like a great way to support LGBT communities is. Um, just educating yourself and like say you hear something ignorant coming out of the mouth of someone straight and cisgendered, have it, being able to correct that person makes a huge difference because a lot of people may say that they're supporting you, but behind closed doors, they're not supporting you full, like fully. So when you support someone fully, you should be doing it across the board in all different aspects yeah. amazing yeah thank you keisha yeah i think uh, um for our allies they need to uh, we are appealing to them to support uh, uh, the black people in terms of lgbti persons and also include them in planning you know some of the some of the this we are not included we are just giving a lot of program like you need to implement this so we need a genuine partnership. Like I've tell you something that even this program that we have with SLF, the active program, it is we, the people of East Africa said, we want mental health. It's not what you want. And the good thing is we, we agreed all together as a team and we submitted something about mental well-being. Other allies will force you to do something that is not even in your head. So it's all about uh, genuine partnership and let people donate. They can donate food, everything that people have. 
I think sometimes you have like 20 crores, you don't need them all. Just give them out. I think it's all about giving, saves a brother's and a sister's life, and that will make me happy. And that will make also our community happy. So it's all about people. It's all, it's all about love. So we need to love one another in all means. Thank you, John. Um, so we are two minutes away from closing and we have two questions. Okay, yes, yes Brent. Actually, I'll be brief. Uh, for me, I would say collaborations. Collaborations and key. If anyone from Black queer community sits on a very important uh, platform, if your sisters from another country they are not represented, please make sure that actually their voices are heard. And if you have an opportunity, please for an, a country or you've heard about uh, opportunity, please don't sit on it. Pass it on so that you can be saving a life somewhere on different co continent. So that's it. And I liked what Keisha said. We are one community, so we need to be together. So. Let us stay together to ensure that actually break all these barriers. Thank you. Thank you. So, King, there's a question for you and then there's a general question. Uh, I'll read them both and then we can attempt to answer them in about two minutes. So King, the question is, how do you think Black LGBTIQ people in Canada can connect with the community in Africa to build global solidarity to end the stigma facing LGBTIQ and HIV and AIDS affected people. And the second question is a general question to all of us. What have you found in your own journey has been the best form of support? Is it therapy or certain activities as an example? Um, so to answer your question, the best way to connect would be through the Stephen Lewis Foundation, but then also connecting with Black Cap um, and the other organizations, aid serving organizations that directly connect with Black communities within Africa. Um, so again, Stephen Lewis Foundation, but then also connecting with Black Cap and other organizations that directly um, impact or directly um, work with organizations in Africa. Um, so that'd be the best way to do that. Um, and then things that I've found that have helped with my mental health was joining Ballroom. Um, so joining Ballroom has turned my life around. I'm not even kidding, it saved my life. Um, to be able to see people who look like me um, represented within community, and then not only to be loved and feel love and support, but then have a place for expression and have a place to decompress and feel and be able to um, connect. So yeah, be, being in ballroom, especially as a Black individual, Black man, Black trans man, it has been phenomenal for me. Thank you. What else has helped for the rest of the panelists? For me personally, I could also Agree that ballroom has definitely helped me with my mental health by, um, you know, just community. I feel like when we're in, when we're in mainstream community, we're not always. Sometimes I feel like we're hiding or we're we're trying to camouflage, and just being able to be in a space where you can let your hair down and just be who you are authentically and nobody is double looking at you or nobody is questioning you. It's a beautiful experience. Um, yeah, so joining Ballroom definitely helped me. I also found um, not only just the art form, you know, benefited me, it's also the family aspect. Um, originally Ballroom was made for like homeless queer youth who are um, racialized for them to have a sense of family, a sense of belonging. That's why we call them houses. So um, that really helped me and impacted my life. Um, also, what really impacted my life in terms of support is Black Cap. Um, before I started working at Black Cap, um, I used to access some of their services and I was a volunteer worker. So like being being in this space where I'm seeing different people who will support me and help me in different avenues in my life really impacted me and gave me a sense of, you know, I don't know, just helped me to continue, basically. 
Thank you, Keisha. Do we have any, apart from John or Grant? I think for me, it's about um, uh, the staff, uh, uh, staff retreat has really supported us because for me, it's something that I never knew, like when you go for team building, you don't know what other people know or how people talk about you. This is something that I would like to do it more because I need to know my staffs. I need to know myself also. I need to express myself, not as a director, where now we are loving, we are doing so many kinds of things, sharing stories, not as a director of an organization that has really impacted my life. And now I know who I work with. I know how people feel about me. I know how, how, how people feel. So I think that's something very important. And for the black people in Global North, because sometimes uh, we think they are like we like I'll be very honest. Most of the time when we come to these Global North meetings, Af people from Africa are not given time to express themselves. So we only see the black people, the black uh, uh, people uh, in the in the Global North talking about themselves, like they speak on our behalf. We have good practice things that we do in Africa, where we need to bring back there, to bring back here and express to people the good thing that Africa is not just, a, Africa is not a country, yeah? Because other people maybe think that Africa is a country. We need to express people that we have things that we do, but we also need to, to be heard. I think we also need to be heard. It's all about collaboration and, and I'm very happy because King is here. We are going to have a very big collaboration because I want, I want them guys to come to Africa and see what happens. I will, yeah, I will ask, we, we can talk to Civil Lewis Foundation. I agree. Yeah. Uh, mine is um, the kind of work I do. When I was growing up, I was actually, I wanted to be a doctor so, so much. That was my career. And then actually I'll give um, in a brief 30 seconds, I grew up with an, uh, in, from an extended family, and my uh, my step uh, I saw my stepbrother dying of HIV, and actually I didn't know any information about HIV. I didn't know even the the, the disease he was suffering from. So when he passed on, I really wanted I was um, uh, curious to see what disease was it because I saw the cataries be, uh, being discriminated from my home, the cataries uh, being seen. So I'm like, really, what is really happening? So whenever you see someone smile, whenever you give a service and someone actually gives you feedback, positive feedback, that keeps me moving. And also the camps whereby we go uh, so much and we bond with, uh, with, uh, with our <laughs> staff members. Because most of the time you're hard on them, you want that report, someone is late at office, late at uh, uh, staff meetings, so you're hard. So it's that time you really loosen up. And that what we do in the retreats, we take off positions. I'm like, yo, Brant, I'll be your chef today. I'm not executive director now. I'll be your chef. I wear my shorts, we dance. So by the time we move out from that camp, people are like, okay, even Brand can do that. Oh, even the director can do that. So, okay. So it helps us to bond more and to get to know the other side of the coin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we've come to the end of our conversation today and I'd like to thank the panelists. You're amazing people. It feels like we should have done two hours. Uh, your, the conversation was rich and we thank you so much for your generosity. We want to thank our listeners and our viewers for being here with us. Uh, we've gone a little bit over time, but you're still here and we thank you for that and the SLF team for organizing these and taking care of us. So thank you very much and may you have a lovely day ahead. Uh, happy Wild Aids Day. <laughs>